Well, good morning. Welcome to Countryside. For all those of you fellowshipping out in the hallways, you can go ahead and make your way into either the main sanctuary or the commons on the north side. Those of you in the commons want to welcome you this morning. And to all of you who are family and friends of our church body who are visiting with us, it's great to see you this morning. We're excited to have you with us. What a joy it is for us to gather together today in worship of our great God. As you make your way in, there are communion elements on the back table, so make sure you grab one of those. And if you would, please stand with me as we prepare to worship in song together today. I'm going to read from Psalm 47, verses 1 through 2. It says, Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is exalted. He is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He's our great king. Let's sing together with joy to him this morning.
We're going to be celebrating the Lord's table this morning. All right. Are we good? All right. Well, I'm just going to, there we go. All right. Good morning. <laughs> We're going to be celebrating the Lord's table this morning. So if you haven't got a chance to go back and one, buy one of the doors on the front to grab one of the elements, you can go ahead and do that right now. I'd like to invite everyone who is here this morning who has believed in Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if you're visiting from another church, from, you know, to come see family or whatever it is. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that is the qualification, and we'd like to invite you to celebrate the Lord's table with us. Now, since that's the qualification, if you haven't believed in Jesus Christ, I'd like to please ask you to refrain from participating in the taking of the elements with us. Um, if you are under church discipline from this church or from another church, or if you have some form of unrepentant sin in your life, I'd also like to ask you to please refrain from participating. So before we begin, let's go ahead and ask God to check our hearts. Let's just take some time of quiet prayer and reflection and confess any sins if necessary. Before we go to God's Word, go ahead and open up your packages. Well, it is already the week of Christmas. Christmas is next week. Now, a lot of you this week, as you're spending time with family, uh, maybe one of your traditions, like a lot of people, is you're going to be giving gifts to one another, and you're going to be opening presents. Uh, this year was the very first year that we took our three-year-old daughter, Esther, to the store, and we told her, you are going to pick out a present for your baby brother, Josiah. And she was super excited, and we had to keep her reminder, no, 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 this isn't a present for you. This is a present for your baby brother. We were trying to teach her about gift giving. And the reason why we did that is because we believe it is biblical. In fact, this tradition of gift giving is a very Christian tradition around Christmas time. Uh, first, you could look at the Magi. They gave presents of gold, frankincense, and myrrh to Jesus. Uh, second, you could look at the early church. They were constantly giving to those who were in need. Uh, Paul, who was a missionary traveling in between churches, often transported those gifts. And third, you could look at early church history. And of course, St. Nicholas, who was a bishop in the third century. He was very famous for giving gifts to the poor and the needy, and that developed into later Christmas traditions. 
But fourth, and this is more important than any of the human traditions and gift givings that happened, fourth, and most importantly, is God himself gave a gift to us, the gift of salvation. And that's the reason why we come together to celebrate the Lord's table, to celebrate communion, is because we remember that Christ Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And Scripture calls this a gift. I'm just going to read two verses in Scripture. First is Romans 3.24. It says that we are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So as we think about gift giving this Christmas week, think about the gift of Christ. That's, that's what Christmas should all be about. You know, the nativity scene, Christ being born in a manger, he came so that one day when he would uh, grow to the age that he would go to the cross, he would die for our sins. That's why we celebrate in taking the elements every week as we're about to take the elements in a moment is the body and his blood is they, we are reminded of it through the bread and through the cup. We're reminded that Christ Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And so this Christmas season, let us remember that as well. The greatest gift of all is the gift of Christ himself in providing a way of salvation for us. So it's at this moment I'd like to ask one of our deacons, Tommy Trendle, to go ahead and pray before we eat. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for who you are. We're so thankful for the gift of your son that you sent him here, um, not in any other form, but in the form of a baby with a body that would one day be broken to repair our broken relationship with you. We thank you for this, Lord, and we thank you that we have this opportunity to remember you this morning. In your name I pray, amen. And Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat. I'd also like to ask another one of our deacons, Jonathan Slavin, to go ahead and pray before we drink. Oh, Lord, you are the master and creator of this entire universe. And that makes you ruler over all, above all, yet... You humbled yourself. You went from the highest of the high to the lowest of the low. You willingly give up your life and shed your blood for us to cover our debt and to pay for our sin. And we are eternally thankful, yet when I try to articulate this thankfulness, it, it feels like whatever I say is inadequate. Maybe, maybe because it is inadequate. So don't let us stop there. Change our hearts. Let our gratitude color everything that we say and everything that we do. You are worthy of more praise than we could ever give you. Amen. And Jesus also said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's drink. All right, you can go ahead and stand as we continue to worship this morning. Yeah. 
give us freedom from sin who lived on earth in perfect days as the true the one way in Jesus the great I am Jesus the great I am He is the light He is the light Heaven's bread and my delight He is the shepherd shining it is the night of our dear Savior's birth long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth a thrill of hope the weary soul rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn fall on your knees oh he
together. Father, it's amazing to think back on that night over 2,000 years ago, the moment when your son entered this world, the moment that we look forward to celebrating every year. Father, we pray that you would drive home the meaning of that moment now, that you would help us to see very clearly all the love that you are demonstrating for us in the sending of the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that you would use that moment to help us celebrate Christmas in a new way, taking our eyes from all of the wonderful things that surround this holiday and centering them and focusing them on your Son, our Savior, the baby born to die. And we pray this in his great and glorious name. Amen. You may be seated. It's good to see you all this morning. Kind of a full house. I'm sure we have some people um, visiting. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Otto Skoog. I'm one of the pastors uh, here at Countryside, and I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas, and I hope that your time here in Olathe and at Countryside is, is uh, exciting, challenging, and encouraging. Now, like many of you, I love Christmas. I, I love everything about it. Uh, some of you may love certain things about it and less others. I, I love everything about it. The lights and the songs, the trees and the gifts, all the smells and the tastes of food. Everything that surrounds the holiday, I, I really love it. Okay, I take that back. I do not like shopping. I, re I really don't like shopping. Uh, there's something about it that always feels like when you're walking into a store, you're competing with everybody else in the store for that one gift right? You know what I mean? Um, you know what I'm surprised about, though? The fact that I love Christmas is how I feel after Christmas. Uh, the season lasts for almost 10% of the year. I mean, it lasts a long, long time, and, you know, really for some stores, it lasts for about a third of the year. But think, think about it. The effects of Christmas don't seem to last much beyond the celebration of Christmas Day itself. I mean, when the gifts are given and opened and the food is consumed and the songs have ended and the lights are turned off, Christmas is gone. And the excitement of it seems to dissipate as well. Why is that? 
Why doesn't it last? Why doesn't the momentum of Christmas propel us forward at least until the end of January? Why doesn't it give us the renewed energy we need to face packed schedules, busy work weeks? Why doesn't it strengthen, strengthen us in the face of health issues and financial shortfalls? I think you know what I mean. Why doesn't it? Now, I'm sure we could all propose answers to the questions that I pose, but how might God answer us if we pose those questions to Him? Why is the celebration of Christmas unable to lift the heaviness of life? I think it's because the heaviness of life was never meant to be lifted by the experience of lights and gifts and food. The heaviness of life was meant to be lifted by the fulfillment of an ancient promise. A promise that our text today reminds us we are still awaiting Look with me at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah was a prophet of God whose name means the Lord is salvation. His ministry as a prophet spanned over 50 years in the reign of four kings of Judah. His ministry began at the end of of the reign of one of the most prosperous kings, Uzziah. The nation was strong financially and strong militarily, but spiritually the people were far from God. And Isaiah had the difficult task of telling the people and their leaders that God was about to judge them for their covenant and faithfulness. His prophecies included some very dark predictions of judgment. Judgment coming at the hands of the surrounding nations, even some oppression from their brothers in the north. And like several of the other prophets, his prophecies, though, were not limited to judgment. They also included promises of deliverance, promises of forgiveness and restoration. His prophecies were not restricted to the dark warnings of coming doom, but they looked forward to the hope of a bright future. Our passage today is from Isaiah 9, and Isaiah 9 follows the dark words of Isaiah 8. But Isaiah 9 contains the words of hope contains the words of darkness turning to light, of gloom turning to glory, of anguish turning to joy, and of oppression turning to freedom. This prediction then leads to our passage. Our passage begins today with the word for. Look down at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. The indication of this little word is that what follows is the reason upon which the previous assurances rest. It's the reason for darkness turning to light. It's the reason for anguish turning to joy. These verses provide the reason for hope. Follow along as I read Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. For to us a child is born... To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it, and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. 
these words were meant to comfort the people. As the nation began to, to, to descend into darkness, they were meant to comfort them. These words were meant to help them face the heaviness of the days ahead with hope and even joy. And if the future promises themselves weren't enough, in the end of the passage, God reveals that He is the one that is to fill them with hope and joy. Isaiah records the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. These final words reveal the fulfillment of these promises is at the center of the heart of God. It is His passion to bring about the fulfillment of these promises. His complete attention and the fullness of His power will bring to pass what the prophet has just proclaimed. The central idea of this passage then is the idea that God is passionate about restoring the joys of life to His people. The joys of clear direction, loving concern, perfect justice, and peace. The true joys of life. But what stands above all these is the promise that these joys are not temporary. These joys, when restored, will be eternal. When they are restored, they will never end. God is passionate about restoring the joys of life to His people. That is the kind of promise that should help them and should help us face the heaviness of life. It provides hope. And with that kind of hope, comes joy. Because this kind of hope is certain. Its fulfillment is the passion or the zeal of God Himself. So to latch on to the hope and joy available to us this morning, I want to highlight two key emphasis of this passage. The first we can, is this. We can find hope and joy in the fulfilled promise of a child. We can find hope and joy in the fulfilled promise of a child. Look back at the beginning of Isaiah 9-6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The promises of verses 1-5 through are bound up with the birth of a child. A child. Now wait, I could see how a child would bring a little light when darkness reigns. I could see how a child could provide a little joy when we're all suffering anguish. Babies can lift spirits like that. That's just about anyone feels lighter in the presence of a newborn. But this is too big of a promise to put onto the shoulders of a baby. To fulfill these promises, we need a warrior like David or a deliverer like Moses, not a child. All that is promised here seems too much for a child. And you know what? You would be right. But there are two things at work here. First, it's true, all that is promised here is too much for a child or too much for an ordinary child. The descriptions here are meant to imply a lot about this child. This child, this son, must be unique. This child must be special. The child of promise here can be no ordinary child, but he is a human child. The prophecy reveals that He will be born. He's not just going to pop into existence in a manger somewhere. He's not just going to wind up in somebody's bedroom or under a tree. The prophecy reveals that He will be born, but it says more than that. 
it says that he will be given. Now that's the key to identify this child, isn't it? In his zeal, the Lord will give this child to humanity through humanity. Yes, this is a child, but it is no ordinary child. This is the child promised to Adam, promised to Abraham, promised to David. This is the child promised to Mary. This is the child behind the celebration of Christmas. This is the child promised by the angel Gabriel with these words. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. The promise of a child in Isaiah is a promise of no ordinary child. This child, this given son, this Jesus is the Son of God. The Son of God! Now wait a minute. If Isaiah was talking about Jesus, then why hasn't the rest of this prophecy come to pass? Remember I said there were two things at work here the early part of these verses. The first, with that these incredible descriptions apply to a child. The second is that prophets often described events side by side that had great spans of time between them. From a distance, they could see the mountain peaks. They could see all of the mountains laid out, but they had no way to judge the valleys between them. And this fact was demonstrated by Jesus himself. On one occasion, Jesus entered a synagogue and was asked to read from the scroll of Isaiah. The passage was actually from Isaiah 61. And Jesus read, and he, when Jesus read, he came to the middle of a sentence and he stopped. He re rolled the scroll and, preparing to sit, uttered that the words he had just read had been fulfilled in their presence. He stopped in the middle of a passage. Why? Because what was next would not come to pass until sometime in the future. What was revealed to Isaiah did not include all of the details between those mountain peaks. It didn't include all the events on the timeline, but he was given enough that at the time of the fulfillment of what he did reveal, it would be possible to identify that prophecy. Jesus was the promised child of Isaiah 9. Only the Son of God could fulfill the promises given here. He had to accomplish something, though, that Isaiah did not reveal in chapter 9. As Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law. Or consider the words of Paul in Romans chapter 8, verse 3, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin He condemned sin in the flesh. The zeal of the Lord had something else to accomplish by giving this child peace, righteousness, and joy could not be had through the mere birth and the presence of Jesus on earth. The sin that brought gloom and anguish and oppression had to be dealt with. It had to be conquered. The debt of sin had to be paid. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And so Jesus was first born to die. 
This is something that Isaiah did not see in chapter 9. But it's something that he saw in chapter 53. Listen to the words recorded there. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we are healed All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is the real miracle of Christmas. That God came into the world to die for our sin. To take the punishment we deserved. That He might not only restore to us the joys of life, but give us eternal life. The joys He promises in Isaiah 9 will not be ours for the span of human life. Those joys will be eternal. Forever. Everlasting joys. John, the disciple of Jesus, expressed these truths in two passages into 1 John 4, 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. This is why we can find hope and joy in the fulfilled promise of a child. Jesus Christ was that child. That child became a man. That man hung on a cross. That man offers you eternal life. Is that man your Savior? Is that man your Lord? Is Jesus the meaning of Christmas for you? Is His sacrifice what your hopes and joys are founded upon? Have you confessed your sin and opened up the best gift that you could ever get in all of eternity? The gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. If you haven't, for unto you a child is born. For unto you a son has been given. Will you receive him today as your Savior? This prophecy was uttered 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Isaiah 53 was uttered 700 years before the birth of Jesus. God has given ample time for us to discern that His Son was given, His Son was sent, His Son was offered. Will you receive? Will you believe? Trust in Him today and you will begin to know the joys of life for all eternity. Reject Him and you may never know those joys. You see, Jesus came to take the wrath of God But if He doesn't take it for you, you will take it for yourself. Receive Him today.
we can find hope and joy this morning in the fulfilled promise of a child. But there's more in our passage this morning. Secondly, we can find hope and joy in the future promise of a king. As mentioned earlier, Isaiah's emphasis here is not on all that the child would accomplish. His emphasis here is to provide the hope of a bright future in the midst of dark times. Look back at verses 6 and 7. I'm going to read them again just to establish the context. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The child promised here in Isaiah 9 will be a king. But why should this king be the source of hope and joy? What is it that makes this king any different from other kings on earth? Well, first, this king will be different because his character will be divine. Now, we have the benefit of hindsight. We can look back at Jesus and we can see his divinity in these terms that are applied to him. We have the record of Jesus' life. Both his words and works testify that he was the Son of God. But the descriptive words given here also testify to that fact. He's called the Wonderful Counselor. Now, Mike is a wonderful counselor, but he is no counselor like Jesus. Sorry, brother. I'm sure he's agreeing with me right now. Jesus' wisdom is like no other. It produces wonder because it is wonderful. It provides clear direction. It is just. It is righteous. It will always honor God. When heeded, His counsel will show forth the glory of God in our lives. During his lifetime, the people noticed this. Scripture says that they marveled at his teaching. They commented on the authority with which he taught. They flocked to him because he was both holy and winsome. He was righteous and welcoming. And his words always magnified the will and the ways of God, not the traditions of men. He exemplified the words of Isaiah 28, verse 29. This also comes from the Lord of hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. He will be called Wonderful Counselor. He will also be called Mighty God. Jesus demonstrated His power as God throughout His three-year ministry. He healed the sick. He calmed the seas. He raised the dead. But it was His dealings with demons that clearly demonstrated that He was no mere man with extraordinary abilities. These powerful beings obeyed Him like a well-trained pet obeys its master. They obeyed His every command to them. They even pleaded for mercy from Him because they knew He was more than just a man. He was the Son of God. This child will be the mighty God. He will also be the everlasting Father. Now this is an interesting description because it highlights two traits of this child. It highlights His eternal nature as the Son of God. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. He is eternal. But it also highlights His fatherly nature. A nature that is like no earthly father. A father of unbending principle, but long-suffering. A father of perfect understanding. A father filled with grace and truth. A father who provides protects and loves his children this child is the everlasting father 
but he is also the Prince of Peace. His nature is to provide and establish peace. And that was exactly what Jesus came to do at his first coming. Now I know you're thinking, well, wait a minute, when I look around I don't see peace. I see division, I see hatred, I see war. Where is this peace? You know, to establish the peace that you and I want to see, that you and I want to experience, something had to be dealt with. Something had to be dealt with first. Sin. Sin is the cause of division. Sin is the cause of hatred. It is the cause of war and every evil that oppresses mankind. But the starting place for peace among man is peace between man and God. That's the starting place. Without that peace, there can be no true peace on earth. And Jesus came to provide that peace. As Paul would record in Romans chapter 5, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we were the enemies of God. If I gave you a moment, you could probably count off five people that you would consider your enemies. Maybe 50. Multiply how you feel about some of those people by infinity. I know you're feeling guilty right now because you even have enemies, but think about it. Think about how just the vision of some people gets you a little riled up. Now think about that times infinity. That's how God felt about you. There was no peace between you and God, and there was no peace that you could make between you and God. There was nothing you could offer God that would bring peace between He and you. The only thing that would bring peace is that if you could survive the suffering of His eternal wrath and come out on the other side unscathed, you cannot. And because of Jesus, if you are a believer in Him and you are trusting in Him, you will not. Because He provided that peace. He is the Prince of Peace. We can find no hope and joy in the future promise of a king without the king having these qualities. But Jesus has all these qualities. The character of this king is unique. His character is Isaiah says, will be divine and his kingdom will be eternally just. Look down at the verses there. You can see the idea of justice and righteousness in those verses. They're the, some of the most exciting elements of this promise. I think you should find that exciting. I find it exciting that this kingdom of Jesus will be eternally just, eternally righteous. It's exciting because no matter how well designed or intended the institutions erected by men will always fail us when it comes to justice and righteousness. But in this kingdom, there will be no corruption. There will be no politics. No jockeying for position and power. There will be no bribes. There will be no compromises. There will be no scandals. There will be no egos to bruise or appease. There will be no favors for the powerful. There will be no enslavement of the poor. There will only be justice and righteousness for all eternity. This 
is the hope of mankind. This is the only hope of mankind. There has only been one man ever born who can rule that type of kingdom. And that is Jesus Christ. Because that type of king must have divine character. As the son of David, Jesus was the rightful heir to David's throne. He's the rightful king of Israel. This is what the angel declared to Mary and the, at the announcement of his conception and future birth. And he said in Luke 1, 32 and 33, he will be great. And we will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. When Jesus returns, he will establish his rule in Israel, and all the nations of the earth will honor him as king. Not only Israel, but they will honor him as king of all the earth. And this is what Pastor Mike has been teaching us from the prophet Daniel. Remember the words about the king and his kingdom from Daniel 7, verse 14. And to him, to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. His character will be divine. And His kingdom will be eternally just. We can find our hope and joy in the future promise of a king. We can find our hope and joy in the future promise of a child. God is passionate about restoring the joys of life to His people So why does Christmas leave us wanting more? Because there is more to come than lights and presents and food. There's more to come that they cannot fulfill. Only Jesus can give us the hope and the joy in the midst of the heaviness of life. And God is passionate about restoring the joys of life to his people. Remember, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Pray with me. Father, we are so grateful for Jesus. We are so grateful that you were willing to send him. We are so grateful that he was willing to come. Father, the gift that You offer us in Jesus cannot be compared to the things we will receive this Christmas. It is so infinitely wonderful, amazing, unbelievable, Father, I pray that you would now turn the eyes of those who trust in Jesus back to him so that they may celebrate this year in a way that doesn't prize possessions, that doesn't savor food, that doesn't marvel at lights, but that is overwhelmed with the love of Jesus. Father, for those who are here this morning that do not call Jesus their Savior, I pray that You would open their eyes to who He truly is. That You would use Isaiah 9, 6 to draw them to Yourself.
God, I pray that they would humble themselves before you, repent of their sin, and turn to Jesus in faith. Do that mighty work, Lord. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We stand with us and sing the first Noel. To certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night that was so deep. No. be seated. It's time for the rest of the story. No, just kidding. <laughs> You're safe. I didn't bring my iPad back up here. No, I have the unique privilege.